you know, I think we learn our best lessons um, from failure. Well, what have you failed at? Uh, well, organic chemistry, for sure. You actually failed? <laughs> um, you know, I think I got a D, if I remember correctly, um, but I had to take it again. And so the second time, I'm like, I don't really want to take it again. I want to take, try something different. Um, there's been a lot of little failures along the way, but that's really the one that turned, for me, kind of turned direction and helped me see something different. A son of two doctors, Livingston Jack Wong never questioned that he would be anything other than a doctor when he grew up. But barely making it through organic chemistry in college was life-changing. Today, he's the chief executive officer of Kamehameha Schools. Livingston Jack Wong, next on Long Story Short. Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox is Hawaii's first weekly television program produced and broadcast in high definition. Aloha mai kako. I'm Leslie Wilcox. Livingston C. Mung Wong Jr., who's best known as Jack, was born into a family of medical doctors. His legendary father, Dr. Livingston Wong, is a retired pioneer in the field of organ transplantation in Hawaii. Jack Wong's sister, Dr. Linda Wong, is blazing her own trail in transplant surgery. His late mother, Dr. Rose Wong, was an internist in private practice. Although Jack Wong grew up with the expectation that he would become a doctor, he ended up going in a different direction. But he stayed close to the values of his childhood. Family, education, and service to others remain precious to him. And these values help guide him in his job as Chief Executive Officer of Kamehameha Schools. Jack Wong was born in Boston, where his Hawaii parents had moved to do their medical residencies. He was named Livingston after his father, and no one could tell him for sure how he picked up the nickname Jack. I've heard lots of stories, but the one that I think I, I really remember was my mom telling me that when they were living in, um, in Boston, it was probably about six months or so after um, the shooting of JFK that uh, I was born. And um, since John F. Kennedy's nickname was Jack, they named me Jack. Um, after John F. Kennedy. And um, I was also a junior, so you can't call me junior all the time. So, so Jack kind of came from there, from Boston. It makes sense, Jack, Boston, yeah, time, yeah. timeline. I think so. So, you know, we had a simple kind of childhood, but um, it was interesting. You know, we had a, um, both my parents were doctors and um, they worked. And um, how many kids? So we had uh, five kids, and I have three older sisters. And, um, they're all very nice to me. And um, I have a younger brother. Who's not nice to you? Well, he's nice. I'm nice to him. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> yes, yeah, so gotcha. we have, uh, there are five of us. And um, we, you know, had a great childhood, but we worked. That's what, you know, we did a lot of, of, of um, following our parents around and their careers and um, supporting what they did. Well, what does that mean? That, does that mean you spent a lot of time in their offices doing your homework? <laughs> yeah, we, yeah. It, we spent a lot of time in their offices. Uh, we waited in the car. Um, but we also um, spent time you know, with my mom in her office you know, helping her with her medical practice. And so we would, we would answer phones, we'd file, um, we'd do all the support things around the side to make sure the practice was good. So um, like a family business, and um, mostly for my mom. What about food? Did you eat in the cafeteria? So, you know, it's interesting because, um, you know, most of our childhood, we, um, we actually grew up at my grandma's house. And so my popo, who was um, living in Nuuanu at the time, um, she used to own a Chinese restaurant a long time ago. And um, so she ran her house like a Chinese restaurant. So we'd come there for dinner every night, come there for lunch, and all my cousins would come. There's probably like 20 of us who eat dinner together every night. And um, so while my parents would work, we'd just go to my grandma's house and uh, eat with our cousins and our uncles and aunts. And so she cooked for us every night like we we're at a Chinese restaurant. That's a, that's a very different um, vision of family. I mean, yeah. a, a family that was close in, in, in many ways, but not conventionally. But what about the personalities of your parents and how they influenced you? You know, it was interesting. You know, my, um, you know I think my dad was, you know, he had a really um, visionary side to him. 
and he liked innovation, he liked taking chances, and, and, I, and I hope I got some of that from him. Um, you know, his work, you know, in transplant surgery, his work in, with the emergency medical services, and understanding people and systems. He did the very first kidney and bone marrow transplants yeah. in Hawaii. Right. That's that's right. a risk. Yeah, so I think it was he's, he was a risk taker. He could see innovation. He had a, a really good vision for the future, and uh, I think he he really brought that. Whereas my mom was very much, you know, in the background. She had a lot of humility to what she was doing. Um, and I think hopefully that part I got from her too. But I think the common thread, and maybe because there were doctors, the common thread was always the human element. Being with the patient, you know, we talked about a lot of things, but it was always about patient care and about how each patient really mattered and uh, not letting down a single patient. And I think, you know, as we approach, you know, our work, whether it's education or it's medicine, or if you're doing, you know, accounting, um, you know, each person matters. And I think that's what we got from my mom, so every single patient matters. She didn't have a lot of patients, but every patient. You know, we, we all knew her patients. We knew, you know, um, we talked to them on the phone when they called. We knew who they were. We knew their families. Jack Wong remembers being a little awkward as a kid, accidentally breaking objects, and coming under the watchful eye of his older sisters, including one he considered scary. You said you have uh, three older sisters, so did the sisters become the de facto mom when um, your, neither parent was present? They all have their own um, mothering ways. And, but my, my second to the oldest sister, Linda, um, she was the boss, right? She was the one who would crack down on the rules, make sure I studied. And um, you know, I remember one, at the end of every school year, you know, when everybody else you know, runs off to summer and they would do things, um, she would head to the bookstore and she'd make us um, buy workbooks because we do math workbooks and English workbooks. And um, she would, all summer long, she, you know, she'd be testing us, keeping us, um, she pushed us really hard. And that was her decision to do that? I think it was her decision. I think she enjoyed um, torturing me, <laughs> but I think she really, you know, she had a, um, a very high sense, you know, of, you know, achievement. And you would listen. And we, and we would listen. All the kids would listen. All the kids would listen, so. Was there pressure on you to become a medical doctor? There was a lot of pressure. And so, you know, it's interesting because, you know, growing up, you know, a lot of times in families you'll be asking the question, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? And in our family, it wasn't what do you want to be when you grow up? It was what kind of doctor do you want to be, Jack? And, um, you know, I remember when I was really young, I'm like, I want to be a surgeon just like my dad. And, um, you know, my, my dad was pushing me to be a surgeon and then he realized, you know, like I had no, um, I had no hand skills. Well, you were breaking a lot of things. I was breaking a lot of things. I was a little clumsy, and I, and I couldn't tie my shoe. And I don't know if this is a test for surgery, but apparently I could not tie my shoe. And even now, I was, you know, I joke around with my family, but I still, I use the bunny ears, because I don't. <laughs> oh, tell, tell people what bunny ears, I, I, I barely remember. There was a rhyme, right, about how to, how to tie your shoes? I don't shoes. know if there's a rhyme. I just know that you know, when you make two loops and you just tie it together as opposed to the one loop and you tie it around. And um, it took me such a long time to tie my shoe. And uh, I think that's when my dad realized, maybe surgery is not for you. So you headed off to UCLA after Punahou, mm -hmm. and did you know, you know, most, most undergraduates don't start off knowing what they want to do. Did you? Yeah, and so I, I spent two years um, doing a science background in chemistry, and then I kind of got stuck on organic chemistry, and then I switched, um, tried a number of different things, and landed in economics, and uh, found a different path, and understood. I like numbers, I like the, um, the analysis that goes with you know finances and economics, um, and you were an outstanding economics grad. I read. Yeah, yeah. so I, I liked I liked the field, and um, law school seemed to come naturally, and um, you know in our family it's it's was expected after you graduate from from college that you'd do more schooling. So it was really like, what do I do next? How did you break it to your father and mother that you weren't going to uh, <laughs> medical school? They, I think they found out. I don't remember them finding out, but I remember. When um, I graduated from um, law school, my dad was saying, okay, you know, good job, you know, but it's not too late to go to medical school. I said, you know, let me just try being a lawyer for a little while and just see how that works out. And what about your sister, Linda, who did become a doctor? And, um, and I know she was very influential in, with, with you and what you studied. What did she say? I think it was, you know, it's interesting. I think she understood um, that she didn't want to see me fail at it or be miserable doing it. So she was very supportive. I mean, she really understood, I think, that um, it's better to succeed and be good at what you want to do than um, fail at something that you, know, you don't really like. Well, it sounds like you weren't really accustomed to failure anyway. Very hard, very hard. 
But you know, I think we learn our best lessons um, from failure. Well, what have you failed at? Uh, well, organic chemistry, for sure. You actually failed? <laughs> um, you know, I think I got a D, if I remember correctly. Um, but I had to take it again. And so the second time, I'm like, I don't really want to take it again. I want to take, try something different. And uh, you, went to, you went into economics. And then w w law isn't exactly uh, you know, an, you know, a logical next step. I don't know. You know, it's interesting. It was uh, maybe in our family, and uh, it, it might just be a little bit of you can be a doctor, or you can be a lawyer. So if you're not going to be a doctor, I guess you're going to be a lawyer. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe there was a little bit of that. After graduating from the UCLA School of Law, Jack Wong worked in corporate law in Los Angeles. When he decided it was time to move home with his wife, he joined a Honolulu law firm. In 1997, Jack Wong accepted a job at Bishop Estate as senior counsel specializing in commercial real estate. In 1997, a year of great tumult, tumultuous year at uh, what was then the Bishop Estate, you joined the team at, at Bishop Estate. And um, so uh, just offhand, I can recall, that was the year that the Broken Trust essay was published in the Honolulu Star Bulletin, written by respected community members saying that the trust is misgoverning. At what point did you walk into this? So I, I walked in, I think, fairly early in that process. I think it was, you know, I remember um, I started and, um, you know, it was starting to, uh, it was like a snowball starting to roll down a hill. And uh, I remember hearing, you know, a few stories, you know, before I started. And um, and what made you want to go to then Bishop Estate? It was interesting. You know, it was, it was. I came to do corporate work, and real estate work. And to me, you know, in, in a lot of ways, you know, our land holdings at Kamehameha Schools, uh, and our corporate work and our investments, um, there's so much to do. There's so much to to operate. So much to run. And uh, that was my background. And so I found it fascinating, uh, from a legal background. A financial background, and then knowing we had a mission behind us um, was amazing. You know, I didn't think much, you know, going there about the governance issues because really was not in the area I was working. But then as time went by, after I, I got there, you could kind of feel the energy change in the place, and you knew that this was something, you know, more than just um, a press story. It, it, I mean, the headlines didn't go away after. Right. It was front page every day, right. and there was a lot of... Um, just a feelings of betrayal and anger, and um, you just wondered if the whole place was going to implode sometimes. Right, right, right. I think we all had a feeling. All of us who were there at the time had a feeling, had that exact feeling. Is, you know, it seemed like you were you were on such shaky ground. Um, yet, you know, for all the things that were going on at a governance level, a lot of our work on our on the staff level was, you know, how do we maintain uh, our operations? How do we maintain the lands? How do we make sure we keep doing good work because that work needed to continue. And, and I think our teachers and our classmates must felt felt the same way. We still got to serve you know, our kids every single day. Once Bishop Estate became Kamehameha Schools, and there were new decisions to be made, and um, they say when, you know, speaking of broken trust, um, they say when something's broken, it, at least it lets the light in. You know, um, what changes had to be made and were made? I think you know what's amazing is that we had some some amazing leaders who really understood the changes we had to make. And so I give so much credit to DJ Mailer, you know, who came before me. And she really understood, you know, that you at first had to heal an organization and a people. And she did a great job of making sure um, we healed and that we came together. And um, we understood, you know, our relationships with our alumni, our teachers, our, our community, our lands. And so her bringing all that together has allowed us to kind of launch from where, where she, she left. Uh, us at a great place, but it really took it took time. It took time to heal the organization. How many years later were you appointed the, interim CEO? So um, it wasn't until um, 2014, I think, that I was I was appointed, and uh, it had been a long journey. This and this year marks 20 years. So you've been CEO yeah. for more than three. Yes, it's been more than three. Yes, and so, um, but it has been an interesting journey, and, and I think along the way, um, I had a progressively understand a lot. I get to progressively understand the organization at a deeper level. And I think that's really what made um, you know, my appointment as interim CEO really special. Because I think at that time I, I understood the organization a lot better. I, I came in understanding the real estate, our investments, and our finances. Um, but I had an opportunity along the way uh, to work on our John Doe case in 2003. And I, I thought, admissions case. Admissions case. And I think that was meaningful um, for the organization. We got to understand kind of our mission and and purpose. Yeah, that's right. So you brought economics and law 
and a love of education. Mm -hmm. I think I remember when you were um, when you were appointed interim CEO, the the endowment was at 10.1 billion, or at least that's what was reported. What what is it now in uh, 2017? You know, right now it's about 11.7, um, but you know, it changes every day. And one thing, you know, we work hard in the organization is to understand that, you know, the size of our endowment and how we manage it has to be long term. And um, you know, the markets change so frequently, um, and if you kind of react to it every day and you react to it every year, um, we have to plan a long, take the long view of how our endowment grows over long periods of time. So it is something we look at carefully. Is that the first thing you look at when you walk in? You just ping. <laughs> how much is it today? I try not to. <laughs> I try, not, but I do watch. I do watch the markets, to, so I understand what's happening. Um, but it's interesting as you watch the markets, you have to watch the political landscape and the global landscape because those things impact the markets. Um, but it also, you know, for us, it's great because it, that's what impacts education too. You know, understanding the global impacts of what's going on politically impacts our markets, impacts our lands. And it's what our kids should be thinking about, because that's the world they're walking into. So we spend a lot of time thinking about what are the global events and what's going on. I know Kamehameha has worked at your, with your leadership on a strategic plan, and I don't, I don't know how you can see that far ahead, but it goes way far. How, how far ahead? So we have, a, um, we have a strategic vision that's a 25-year vision. So it's supposed to be one generation. Um, our strategic plan is five years, and so we, we do it in chunks. And um, our first five-year plan is um, till 2020, and our um, long-term vision goes out to 2040. And um, I think an organization like ours has the benefit of seeing long-term, um, but you also need uh, a sense of urgency. And so the long-term vision is really to give us that long-term vision of where we're going and how do we see in one generation um, change in our community. Um, the five-year plan gives it a sense of urgency so that your work every day is towards shorter goals. And so for, for us, you have to have a combination of both. Um, because um, the princess left such a large legacy to, um, to Kamehameha, uh, I know people are always saying, well, let Kamehameha do it. They got all the money. Um, is that true? You know, I mean, should, should you be doing more? What's interesting, what we're really learning on our strategic planning process is, you know, our vision is really to have every Native Hawaiian succeeding in education. And um, every Native Hawaiian. Every Native Hawaiian to succeed in education. And by every Native Hawaiian, we also mean every child in the state should be succeeding in education. Um, but this is not something even we can do alone. And um, the realization that you have a long term vision that you can't do alone um, really requires you to re examine how you approach um, your strategies. And for us, it's, it's about partnering. It's about working with other organizations that are already doing great work and really supporting them. Managing partnerships is difficult. I mean, as we see in marriage, <laughs> um, it must, is, has it been difficult to find good partners or, or are there, you know, how do you pick a partner? So I think you know, there's so many people doing wonderful work in education that I don't, we've not had any problem at all finding great partners mm -hmm. doing great work. I think you know, my question is how do we support them best? Mm -hmm and how do we make sure they succeed? And um, I think that's always a great conversation to have, but it also is, you know, everything we do, whether it's partnerships or by ourselves, is always about choices, right? Because there's so many great things we can do. How do we choose as a community what's the right path for education? And that's not something we can do alone. You know, we at Kamehameha Schools can't do it alone. We need partners and partners need to work So together. these are education partners? There's not only partners in education, there's partners in social service. We certainly have our Lee Trust that we need to be working together better and making sure we can all move the um, uh, Lahui together um, successfully. So we you know, absolutely have to work together with all those partners. And um, I think this, we're not the only organization. I think a lot of organizations are looking on how to better partner in this community. There are some things that have been really difficult to get a handle on. I mean, uh, somebody was here the other day and saying, you know, um, one of the big elephants in any room is Hawaiian sovereignty. And also what's happening on Mauna Kea, you know, is it really a clash between Western science and Hawaiian culture? I mean, is that how it should be posited? And, and what can Kamehameha do to, um, to bring some light here? It's interesting, and you know, I think you know, for us, you know, our role is education, and our role is to make sure our keiki, you know, um, are well educated, make good choices, understand their community, understand how to lead their community, and um, from that, I believe great things will happen. 
And um, whether they're on the left side of an issue or the right side of an issue or right in the middle of an issue, um, I want our keiki to engage. Because when our community is engaged, we will move forward. My, our fear should be a lack of engagement when we're not hearing noise, when we don't hear from our communities and our keiki and our youth. Um, that's when we should worry. When we hear noise and we hear people engaging, we should smile. So you're not, you're, Kamehameha doesn't want to be in the position of making decisions. It wants to promote education and That's where we engagement start. and go for it with, uh, with training. Our, our start is always, if we put our kiki in the center, we start with that premise and we, we're saying, what do, what do our kiki need to succeed as, as adults? And if they need to know how to engage civilly with their community, if they know how to articulate an issue and participate in the process, um, and if they know how to have their voice be heard, then we're doing our work. And that, that's the vision for our future. Would you um, lay out in numbers um, the, the breadth of Kamehameha, you know, the real estate and students? So let's see if I can, um, let's see if I can get the numbers. The, um, right now we have about um, 5,400 um, kids in our um, K through 12. We have three campuses. We have um, about 5,400 students and we graduate about 700 every year on our Maui campus, our Hilo campus, and our Hawaii Island campus. We have 30 preschools, and we have about 1,600 keiki in our preschools. And um, we have scholarships that um, educate another 1,800 in our preschools, and another 500 in K through 12, and another 2,000 in post high. And so, um, and then we have community education programs that if you count how they reach our keiki and our families, probably hit another 15,000. Um, Native Hawaiians. And so kind of by the numbers, that's our reach. Um, we also have about 363,000 acres of land that we manage, um, about half of it agriculture. And um, we have commercial lands in about 15 different areas that we focus on. It's just a, it's a tremendous kuleana. It is. Uh, so could you maybe share some um, leadership tips about how you maintain every day, it's, it's just huge. I try to draw from, you know, from my parents. And, uh, you know, I think if I draw from my, you know, my dad, I, I understand, you know, that we have to understand how systems work. We have to know how to innovate and how to lead and have it work from a vision. And so I think that's always important what we do. But I also know from, you know, my mom, we have to make sure, and I have to make sure we have a sense of humility. We know how to help others succeed. Is it always, possible to just know what is in the best interest of the keiki? No, it's, you know, I think that's why, you know, we have to work with partners and we need a lot of voices. We have a great board, we have executives, we have um, teachers and administrators. All the voices have to help understand that because it cannot just be my voice. It cannot just be the voice of a few. And that's the, you know, that's the challenge in education is that um, everybody's working on, everybody has great ideas, um, yet we all have to figure out how to best serve each, each child. And you have to be an optimist too, right? And you have to be an optimist. You have to see, um, you have to see the positive and uh, the growth. And so a lot of times, you know, our biggest um, thing is we have to see the good things in what we're doing. And that's our encouragement, right? And understanding the really, really good things we do. You know, I just, I'm trying to imagine sitting at your desk and you have so many constituencies to address. Um, I mean, and not quote, just the financials and the, the legal legalities. I mean, there there are so many people affected in so many different ways by by the the school and the investments. And um, you know, some have felt betrayed. Some have very different ideas than others. And how do you how do you manage that? There's many ways to manage. My dad or my mom would look to something where you know when when we talked about their work and things were stressful. You know, they always it was always the patient was in the center of everything they did. Patient care, taking care of their families. And I think the same for us. And so you're saying put the cakey in the middle. We put the cake in the center of everything we do, and we make better decisions. And um, I pause, and I think about that a lot. That, and we think about you know, our roots and our history and our ancestry and Princess Poahi. And, you know, we make decisions based on our history and our values. It used to be that people felt like they had to choose between their culture and um, a good, edu a quote, good education. Now, I think you, you're addressing that, right? Absolutely. How have you addressed it? You don't have to choose between culture and, and academics. You can have both. And uh, when we're really strong in what we do, understand our culture and our kids understand their identity and their background uh, and their ancestry, 
they will find academic success because of that strength. And so how do we treat our culture as a competitive advantage? And how do you grow from that strength? And absolutely what you're saying is true. That if you're grounded in the Hawaiian culture, it, it can make you much better in anything academic, you do. Right. And that's, that will become your competitive advantage um, in the classroom, in the workplace, out in our community. And that's something we believe as an organization. We've always believed that. Um, but we have to feel like we can say it out loud. You know, you talked about um, your family mm -hmm. growing up. What's your family like? Oh, my, my family's wonderful. I, it's, it's interesting, you know, I have my wife who um, we met at UCLA. And um, we have three wonderful kids. And it's... Um, and do you expect them to be lawyers like you're expected to be a doctor? Yeah, you know, it's funny. It's funny. We had a discussion when our kids were young, you know, and, and I'm very careful not to um, tell my kids what they should be doing. And I think one, one thing I just don't know is I don't know um, what great areas to go into now. I mean, I think people, kids have to figure that out and see what the future is going to bring to them. And so I have one daughter who lives in Los Angeles, and um, she's in finance. I have a second daughter who's in New York, and she's doing um, communications. I heard that's a good field. <laughs> well, you've got to communicate. <laughs> and um, I have a son who's in ninth grade, so we have a wonderful family. And, um, you know, I think kind of like, you know, my own family, I think we try to stay, you know, quiet and do our, do our, do our work, and everybody tries to work hard and um, try to stay in the background when we can. And is the family business Kamehameha? Right now, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Our conversation took place in the fall of 2017. Mahalo to Livingston Jack Wong of Honolulu, the CEO of Kamehameha Schools, for sharing his story with us. And mahalo to you for joining us. For PBS Hawaii and Long Story Short, I'm Leslie Wilcox. Aloha a hui ho. For audio and written transcripts of all episodes of Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, visit pbshawaii.org. To download free podcasts of Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, go to the Apple iTunes Store or visit pbshawaii.org. You are a lifer at Punahou. Mm -hmm. You're of Chinese ancestry, and you are sitting in the CEO spot at Kamehameha Schools for Hawaiian, you know, primarily for, for the Hawaiians and Hawaiian culture. Is that, um, does that get difficult for you at some points? I don't think so. You know, it's never about me, it's always about those we serve, and I'll let the rest fall as it falls. Um, so I, I don't think about that. I know what I'm here to do, and I'm gonna do my best, and I'm gonna put 110% into it, and um, I believe in our mission, I believe in what we're doing, and um, I think it's a calling, and uh, I, I think, um, you know, I'll do my best every single day. And then at some point, somebody will say, okay, you're done. And maybe that's okay, too. <laughs>